Hello, Paul. I'm Mark. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Where are you from, in England? Uh, from West. I'm mm West. -hmm. All right. My wife and I spent a summer in Brandon. Oh, yeah, I know that. Okay. So, at least back yet. Yes. At least back yet. Yeah. Of course, when the workshop starts, our batteries run out. It's always the best. Yeah, it's 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 the best. In uh, Cornwall, which is south of West yes. England, yes. and he was walking on when he was walking with we women. Yeah. 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 Surprising, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 This is oh, oh, so you you want mine, yeah. Like, yeah, Bruce and Paul. Oh, so were you two fellows uh, over here on Sunset? Oh, yeah. Bruce lives here. I'm a good one. 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 I'm a good one.
Well, all of you who are here, thank you for being in our workshop. Most of you are alumni, and we're so grateful you've come back. And among the alumni, this young man right here, uh, Tommy Maxwell. He was young when he came. Really, he wasn't. He came yeah. with a college degree from, uh, what was it, Louisiana Monroe? Right. Louisiana Tech. Uh, Louisiana Tech and uh, accounting, is that right? And uh, had a long time desire, interest in preaching, came through the school and uh, was for a while, uh, worked in Scotland and uh, mission work there and also in, uh, I believe you were in Oklahoma for a while, but he's been in Puyallup, Washington. How long has it been now? Uh, right at two years now two. in Washington. Two years, his lovely wife Pam uh, and Tommy, they have three children now or four? Four, yeah. five, six. Four, four five. <laughs> <laughs> Next year will be five. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, in addition to his studies here, Tommy has done some uh, graduate work, uh, having already earned his master's degree and working toward a doctorate degree. And uh, he's, a, he's a good student, but he's also very good working with people. And uh, he's got a lovely family. I just appreciate him for the ministry that he's doing. And I'm going to say a prayer, uh, and then he'll begin his class. God, thank you so much for Tommy and Pam and the good work they've been doing. And I uh, pray that you'll continue to bless them to continue to work and affect uh, the lives of people. Thank you, Father, for his, uh, his, his life of devotion to you. Thank you for his dad and and the good man that he is that has encouraged him in so many ways. And I pray, Father, that you'll bless Tommy and encourage us uh, with what he has to say. Uh, keep him uh, uh, continually studying your word and studying to, in ways to improve himself to be effective in ministry. Pray you'll bless all of us in this time together. In Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Well, it's a privilege to, to have the opportunity to be able to speak to you this morning uh, about the uh, a topic that I'm passionate about, specifically in its relation to uh, another thing that I'm passionate about being church growth. But I think one of the key aspects of that is having a strong leadership. Amen. You're not going to have a healthy and growing church if you don't have if you don't have strong leaders. Now, what we're going to be talking about in here primarily is the eldership. But some of the principles we're talking about really apply to leadership across the board when you're talking about in the church. But we're primarily talking about training the next generation of church elders. Um, and I think that that is vitally important to the church, and it is something that is, uh, that's needed. Um, now, what we're going to be looking at in this class, we're going to cover uh, several areas of this. Why is this needed? What's so, why is this so important? Who are we looking to select? If we're going to train men to be the next generation of church leaders to help carry us into the next generation, to help lead us in making disciples for another generation, who are we looking for? What kind of characteristics? And what are we going to teach them to get them prepared? Because there's a lot of things that they uh, need to have at least some exposure to before going into such an important work. And then when we get to the end of it, we'll spend at least uh, hopefully a little bit of time uh, looking at what we're doing in the church in Puyallup, Washington. As we have uh, begun in the last several months, we've begun a program to try to train, to identify and train uh, several men as the next generation of elders there. And we're currently uh, almost halfway through our first time through it. Um, which leads me to a couple of things that I think I need to get out of the way before I get into the material. Uh, first, this is still a work in progress. It's by no means perfected, and we'll certainly find areas that need improving as we uh, work our way through it. And as such, I don't propose to have all the answers on the subject, um, especially as I myself talking about elders, I'm not old enough to be one, I'm not qualified, so uh, this has been developed and is being developed based on the need that the elders and I see for uh, see within the church where we are at. Uh, it's being developed and discussed uh, with my elders, so I'm working with them. And it's also based on what I've learned in taking several leadership courses with Dr. Bob Turner. 
And so a lot of this material is, is coming from these men that I've learned from, uh, men who are much wiser and much more experienced than I am. Um, and so I want to be very clear on that. Uh, but also as we speak about the need for elders and elder training, as we talk about what's important to that and some things, we'll talk about some areas of, uh, of weakness in the current church. I want to be very clear that this is not intended to be uh, disparaging toward any elders that I either have served under in the past or am currently serving under. Uh, I have a very high opinion of these men. Uh, I've observed the things that they deal with in, uh, in elders meetings, some of the things they have to deal with, and I've seen elders in multiple places face accusations and harsh and undeserved criticism. Um, but every elder that I have ever, ever worked with as far as I've been able to tell, is someone who genuinely loves the Lord and his church. And so my desire in this is to see the church grow, to see the church strengthened. And so I just want to be very clear on that as we're going through some of this material. Uh, and when we get towards the end of the class, uh, so that I don't forget to mention this, I mentioned we are going through a program in Puyallup. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But if that's something after we get finished that you would like to see more information on, I would be glad to email you uh, some information on that after this workshop's over once I get back uh, once I get back up to Washington. I've got a notebook up here if anyone would like that. After we finish up, if you'll share your email address with me, uh, I would be glad to, to share more information with you. Um, with that being said, I'm talking about training the next generation of church leaders, specifically elders. Why is this needed? Um, and again, this is not intended to be negative towards uh, anyone serving as elders, but they they have to face a lot of very difficult issues and sometimes uh, undeserved criticism. Uh, how many elders do we have in the room right now? I'm seeing you know four, five, uh, five or six men in here who serve as elders. Uh, so if you were serving at the time of the COVID pandemic in 2020. Do you face any difficulties in making decisions? Do we go online? Do we go to split <coughs> services? Do we try to go to multiple services to be able to have people spread out further? And regardless of the, the decision that you made, I'm going to guess probably every one of you heard some criticism for it. Because it seemed like to someone in the congregation, or usually multiple, there wasn't a way to make a, the right decision on that. Even though it was a situation that no one had ever faced that was serving as an elder, and you're faced with trying to do the best you can. It was a difficult situation. And so leadership in, uh, in our congregations is faced with a lot of very difficult things. But as we look at the state of leadership in a lot of congregations, we see churches that either don't have elders, churches who don't have enough elders. And in many cases, there's no real plan or idea of where are we going to get men to serve in this capacity? What are we going to do about this need? Uh, and so without some plan, without some ideas, without taking action and being intentional, the leadership in a lot of our congregations is, to put it bluntly, can be in trouble. And so we need, we need a, a way forward with this. Uh, and in many of our congregation, the elders that are serving, uh, I would suggest have received little or no training in how to lead the Lord's church effectively prior to being put in that position. And the result, unfortunately, is that sometimes the church can be run more like a business than the church we read of in the New Testament. We see this. Uh, my PowerPoint's not working. I'm not sure if. Well, if we can figure out how to get that working, I'll show you in a little while. Uh, but I'll go ahead and just read. I've got it in my notes. Um, Gene Glenn and Mark Newton have written a book called Elder Preacher Relationships That Last. Um, and they say in there that it's easy sometimes to allow a selection of elders to become a popularity contest, or we leave it to an elder search committee. And it seems today that we put more emphasis on the business aspect of leadership than the biblical aspect of leadership. We tend to look more at where a man is on the social ladder than how close he is to God. Um, let me see if that's... Um, still yeah, still stuck. Um, in the first congregation where I served as the pulpit minister, uh, one of my elders there had served prior to me some years for 21 years in preaching. Uh, he made the point that, you know, he had, for 21 years, he had sat through elders meetings. And before he became an elder, he said, 
having sat through all of these meetings, he said, I thought I knew what it was like to be an elder before I ever got into that position. And I, uh, in interviewing him about some leadership succession stuff a little while back, he said, and I quote, when I became an elder, I really didn't know much about eldering. He said, I thought I knew what it meant. But when I got into the position, he said, I had no idea what that was actually like. And so, and he expressed a desire for there to be something like a, a some type of a class or a training program to uh, to help men who were being considered for that uh, for that job to step into it more prepared. Now we expect and require when we look at other leadership within the church. For instance, we expect, and if you read uh, you know advertisements for you know preachers needed or preachers wanted. We expect our minister to have either a certificate from a school of preaching or sometimes, depending on the church, require even graduate degrees. <clears throat> but we don't tend to think much of preparation when it comes to the role of an elder, which is just as, if not more, important. That's right. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul, as he was speaking to the Ephesian elders, giving them his farewell, he said to them, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which, he says, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The role of leadership in the church has, has eternal consequence. But unfortunately, sometimes we throw men into the position without telling them what it's like at all. Bob Turner was sharing with me earlier and preparing for some of his work in leadership. He, uh, he shared with me that one of the questions he asked of elderships when he talked to them, he asked them, what have you learned since becoming an elder that you wish you would have known before becoming one? And one of the responses he shared with me was, how many lives I would change? Mm. With the sentiment of, if he would have known the change and the impact, he would have... Uh, he would have done more to prepare uh, ahead of time for the job that he was getting ready to do. Because the job of elder has eternal significance. Mm -hmm. We can't under or we can't overstate the importance of the work that these men do. Future leaders then need to be taught something of what they're going to face before they're just thrown into the deep end. You know, and observing elders in the three congregations that I've worked with, one in the UK working primarily with outreach, and then in uh, South Central Oklahoma, Warrego, Oklahoma, with uh, as the pulpit minister there now, and as uh, the pulpit minister in uh, Puyallup, Washington. One of the things I've, that I've observed in all three of these congregations is that the elders have to deal with some really difficult stuff. It can't be an easy job. And so if we're going to prepare them, they need, or we need to, to have these men exposed to some of the things that they're going to face whenever they get into the position. For example, the first time these men are taught something about conflict resolution doesn't need to be when they have angry member on each side of them <laughs> demanding that you resolve this issue for us. That's not the way to for that to begin. Now, there's always you know stretching and growing because learning something in a classroom and learning something in a more uh, in this type of environment uh, is a little different than being in the situation itself. But we need to prepare them for some of the things that are coming. Finding those who uh, and so as we look for for men to do this, finding those who fit the qualifications of elders is more than just going down the checklist of technicalities that they met all the requirements. Well, brother so-and-so filled in as a Bible class teacher a couple of times, he's able to teach. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm, what I'm saying in this. We absolutely cannot dispense with any of the qualifications of elders that we read of in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Paul said in both of those, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that the elder must be, as he begins that list, and in the Greek, that comes from a term that should be translated as the elder absolutely must be. It is essential. It is necessary. These aren't optional. But what I mean is, is when we look at something like the qualification of being able to teach, is that it takes more than a warm body in front of a classroom to be a teacher. Is this someone who can actually equip the saints for the work of service? 
Is this someone who can impart wisdom and knowledge to those in the church that need it? That's what we're really looking for here. Are they able to do the job? Is this someone who has enough knowledge, Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, to refute those who contradict sound doctrine? Mm -hmm. That takes a good working knowledge of Scripture and the ability not only to identify what's wrong, but also to point out what is right and to be able to handle it in a way that has tact, to speak the truth in love, and we'll speak to that more in just a moment. But this is needed because without intentional action, many congregations won't have a next generation of men to lead. But leadership succession is biblical. If you've got your Bibles, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul told Timothy there, The things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You teach men who can teach men who can teach men who can teach men from generation to generation. Leadership succession within the church is a biblical concept. And so we need to have a way to train the next generation of leaders within the church. Now, as I mentioned before in Puyallup, we're in the process of developing and implementing uh, a plan to train our next generation of elders. Our three current elders have identified the need for more men to lead, and I'm working together with them on developing a program, the one that we're using now, and going through it for the very first time. So we're kind of a, a work in progress, making some changes as we see, uh, as we go. Our approach isn't necessarily professional or polished or perfected by any means, but it, uh, it's the response to a need that the church has. Uh, it's something that, that the, the group of us, the elders and ministers, have, have seen that we need, and it's, been, um, it's going to be adapted as we work our way through it the first time and we learn what worked and what did, what would be, what did we miss, what needs to be added. But as we look at training the next generation of elders, there's a couple of things that we need to think about. Number one, who are we going to pick? What are we going to teach them? Because you need to be selective. Who are you going to train to lead the church of Jesus Christ? Not everyone is cut out to be in leadership. And if you've ever been in, in church leadership, you know the difference. There are some that have a maturity. You can talk to them. You can be direct with them. And there are others you have to handle with kid gloves. Because they either get upset, they get offended at anything that gets thrown their way. You have to be selective. Who are you going to pick to be in this position? Because church leadership is not a popularity contest. It's not just about who's the most successful businessman. Who has spiritual maturity and the ability to lead people to Christ, the ability to mature people in Christ, the ability to set an example of what a faithful Christian is. And we see that, and we're not going to go through the, the list of qualifications of elders specifically, but you see that come through very clearly in those lists. And the first thing I would suggest to you is that we need to look for men of integrity. Yeah. Without integrity, nothing else really matters. Because people are not going to willingly follow someone that they do not trust. The importance of integrity and leadership can be seen in both the secular uh, and spiritual contexts. For instance, in their book, uh, The Truth About Leadership, James Cousas and Barry Posner said that if people are going to willingly follow you, it is because you, they believe you're credible. To be credible in action, you must do what you say you will do. Now that's someone talking about the business world. But when God selected someone to lead his people in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, he selected Nehemiah, a man of integrity. Because this was supposed to be up on the PowerPoint. Uh, open your Bibles with you, if you will, to Nehemiah chapter 1. And we're going to look at a section of the prayer that Nehemiah prayed. Because when God chooses someone to lead his people, he chooses someone who is honest. He chooses someone who is what he says he is. And there is a key part in this prayer as Nehemiah has just learned of the condition of Jerusalem and the walls of Jerusalem. He said, I heard these words, and this is verse 4. He said, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven, and I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, 
the great and awesome God who, uh, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and who keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I'm praying before you now, day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the, sons, uh, the sins of the sons of Israel, which we've sinned against you. And so you know, he recognizes the reason that they're in the situation they're in. Why did they go into exile? Idolatry, sin, immorality, sin of every kind. But notice in speaking of Nehemiah's integrity here, he doesn't pretend like it was just all of those guys over there sin. Everyone else messed this up. He says here, I and my father's house have sinned. He acknowledges his part of the problem. It takes a humility and an integrity to do such a thing. And the qualifications of elders there, uh, Paul told Timothy they are to be above reproach and to have a good reputation with those outside the church. Now, part of this would have to do with his integrity and in business dealings. How's he perceived in the community? If you've got a man who is known in the community for not being quite honest in his financial dealings or being a little bit ugly and rude and maybe using some language he ought not whenever he's dealing with people in a secular context. That's not the guy you won't leave the church. Yeah. Someone who is above reproach. Now, this doesn't mean sinless or perfect, but in general, this needs to be someone who has the reputation and the character who's not going to be able to be accused of you know, these, all of these big significant things. Hey, he's going to leave the church and then these big scandals come out. You need to look at the character. Is this someone of integrity? You need to look for men of passion to lead the church. And what I mean by that, you know, we think about passion. A lot of times we think about people who are, you know, they get, over, they get really excited and emotional. That's not what I'm talking about. Bob Turner writes in his book, Essential, passion is the fuel for leadership vision. Passion is the activist behind the achievement. Passion is the driving motivation within leaders. He goes on a little bit later to say that leaders without passion will not lead. They lose interest, they cannot inspire others, and they lack the drive to achieve their vision. In other words, a leader needs to be one who demonstrably believes what he claims. Is this someone by his life and his choice and his commitments, is this someone who actually believes the message that he's saying? Is this someone who really believes that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most significant and the priority for life? That's the guy you won't leave the church. That's the guy that you want to be the example for everyone else. You want someone who would be willing to make a significant changes and even sacrifices because serving God is just that important. You want somebody who will look at his family and his career and the things in his life and say, you know what, maybe I need to change jobs because this is causing me to be further away from God. The person who is willing to make sacrifices for the Lord. Well, that's in Nehemiah's prayer too, verse 11. Yes. In 111 there, delights to fear the name of the Lord. Yes, we see this, and, and there's a lot of these things that we see, as you mentioned there, in, uh, in Nehemiah. And we're going to refer to him several times, but he is... If you're looking for the biblical textbook on leadership, spend some time in Nehemiah. Uh, but in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15, you see that as well. Someone who was willing to stick it out. He went through hardship. He dealt with the, the discouragement. He dealt with the criticism. He dealt with the opposition. And in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15, it says that they finished rebuilding the wall in just 52 days. Amen. Because this was a man who was committed to doing work. He wasn't just committed to telling everyone else to do the work. He got his hands dirty doing it as well. The church leaders today need to have the passion for the purpose of the church, even when others are struggling with it. We need to look for men who are willing to learn. In the same book, The Truth About Leadership, uh, Kuzis and Vosner mentioned that the best leaders are the best learners. Those who will stay on top in their field, they'll continue to stay up to date. And they don't have this attitude of, well, I learned everything that I needed to know before and I've got it figured out. It doesn't take too long before that person gets into trouble. Willingness to learn indicates a level of humility and recognition that I don't have it all figured out. Or as 
The Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Yeah. Any person in leadership, this should characterize every Christian, that we have a willingness to learn and grow and a desire to learn and grow. That's who you're looking for to lead the church. And finally, you want to look for men who are not driven by their emotions. Because when harsh and undeserved criticism comes up by sometimes an overly emotional member, someone who feels that they've been wronged or something has happened that's not right, you need men who are able to stay calm and collected even when the heat gets turned up. True. People who won't allow their emotions to get the best of them and get angry and lose their temper. When inside, that may be exactly what they're thinking. They have the ability to stay calm and to respond rather than to react. Now, as we train the next generation, there are several things that are important for us to teach them. And like I said later on and, uh, and after the class, I'd be glad to, to share the specific ways that we're doing this. I'll email you the, the information on what we're teaching and the specific things that we're doing in Puyallup. But some of the things in principle that you need to teach these men is first off, they need to have a knowledge of the Bible and how to study it. The first and probably the most obvious thing that church leaders need to be competent in is the Word of God. If we're going to lead people towards Jesus Christ, it stands to reason that we need to have a good working knowledge of who He is and what His purpose is and what His mission is for us. Sure. We can't lead people to Him if we don't know Him ourselves. We'd already mentioned uh, Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, that elders are to be those who have the ability to refute those who contradict sound doctrine. That can't happen if you don't have a good working knowledge of Scripture. It means that these men need to know the truth well enough to be able to not only recognize what's false, but to be able to point to what is true. And to say, here's what is correct, or to put things back into their proper context. You need to have men of vision and planning. A leader has to know where he's leading people to. As I tell you, if a leader doesn't know where he's going, I promise you no one else does either. <laughs> Without a clear vision, there's no target for the church to aim for, no clear goal to everyone, for everyone to strive for. And unfortunately, what ends up happening in a lot of cases is the church begin, you know, becomes or gets to where it can be uh, described as we see Israel described in the book of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right and so nice. There's no clear direction. The leaders in the church need to be men of vision, men that have a plan, men that have goals, men that know where we're going and how are we going to get there. Who does God want us to become? Or as Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 14, a blind man guides a blind man. Both will fall into a pit. <clears throat> Aubrey Malfer's writing writes in his book, Developing a Vision for Ministry. He says a characteristic of far too many North American ministries in general, and churches in particular, is a lack of direction. They simply don't know where they're going, and many have not even thought about it. God has given the church a mission with eternal consequences. But do we have a plan? Do we have a vision for how are we going to do this? Have we even thought through it? A leader is one who spends time concentrating on the future of the church. Where would the Lord want us to be as a congregation in five years from now? Where would he want us to be 10 years, 15, 20 years from now? What does he want the next generation of this congregation to look like? And how are we going to get there? How are we going to prepare the next generation to be able to, to be effective, to be what God wants us to be? We need to teach men how to look into the, how to, to envision, how to, to think about the future and have a plan for it. The next generation of leaders needs to be trained in how to communicate. An essential part of leadership is being able to communicate. It's not enough to have an understanding, a vision, and a plan. It's got to be communicated to the church so that everyone can understand it. You may understand scripture, but if you can't put that understanding into the mind of someone else, what good is it in a leadership position? 
may have a vision and plan, but if it can't be communicated, it's no good. If people can't understand it. Aubrey Malfers also wrote that leaders must be able to articulate what God has called them to do. Not being able to do so is to invite disaster. Mm -hmm. I want to look at a masterpiece of leadership communication also in the book of Nehemiah. We go with me to Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Nehemiah has gotten permission now from the king. We've already seen his, his well, we've read part of his prayer in chapter 1. The Lord has sent him back to Jerusalem. I'm sorry, what verse again? That's Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Then I said to them, now Nehemiah is speaking to the Jews. Here's the people that are going to get up and do the work. Because he knows what's got to happen. He's gone out and surveyed it. He knows what's got to happen. And now he's got to get it across to everybody else. <clears throat> Not just the information, but also motivation to get up and do it. I said to them, you see the bad situation we're in. Jerusalem is desolate. Its gates are burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. Nehemiah's communication to the Jews is an incredible example of how to get things across. He articulated to them, to, uh, to them the problem. He didn't hide from what was actually going on. He didn't sugarcoat it or say, well, you know, it's really not all that bad. This place is in ruins. And so he, he articulated very clearly what the problem was. And he gave them the solution and the reason to do something about it. Let's rebuild. Well, that's simple. There's the plan. Here's what we need to do. Why? So that we will no longer be a reproach. He gave them a clear picture of the problem a clear picture of what needed to happen to solve it, and he gave them a purpose for it. You know, the next question might be, well, Nehemiah, how in the world do you think this is going to work out? Why do you think this would be successful? And that's where he gets into the next verse. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me. This all sounds like a good idea, Nehemiah, but this will never work. Yeah, well, God's been with me. He's given me the favor of the king. Artaxerxes had already given him all of the documents that he would need to be able to travel to where he would need to go to get the supplies and the, everything he would need to be able to rebuild. Nehemiah not only gave them a picture of the situation, he gave them the solution, the plan to fix it, he gave them the purpose for why to fix it, and then he gave them the motivation they needed to believe that this would actually work. God has been with us. You know, Jesus Christ has given us a mission. Amen. Go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. Well, that's a real grand plan. How do we know that's going to work? I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. <clears throat> but do we communicate that promise to the church? I'm going to tell you, that's one of the most motivating promises there, you know, we, we focus on the, the command there, the imperative of make disciples, and we should. We need to give attention to it. But a lot of times, oh, we get discouraged. Nobody's interested. Nobody is, so this will never work. But do we communicate to people? We're not alone. Leaders need to be taught how to communicate. We've got a mission, but our God goes with us. As we teach people how to to communicate within the church, there are several things, several principles of effective communication that are important. First one being communication works better within relationship. It works better when the leader knows his people. The Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, the first three or four verses there, that the elder is to be among the flock. Communication works better. It comes across it is listened to more when they're listening to someone that they have a relationship with. We need to speak positively. If the leaders of the church, and this applies to both ministers who speak and preach, it also applies to elders who, uh, who are guiding the church, 
If they speak gloom and doom and pessimism, guess what the church is going to get? That's exactly what you're going to hear from the church. That's the attitude you're going to see. We need to speak positively. If the church is to believe that the future of the congregation is bright, that we can grow, that God will be with us and this can be successful if we will go out faithfully and do what he told us to do, that we can succeed and that God will give the increase, we've got to speak positively. The hand of our God is with us. We need to speak to the congregation in a way that they know we really believe what we're saying. We need to speak the truth in love. You know, you can say everything technically right and still be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we need to speak the truth in the right manner. Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. And this is especially important when we're dealing with a weak member or someone who's caught in sin. We need to speak with patience and understanding. Not to condone sin or to make, a, make it to be something that's not serious. But with the goal in mind, we're trying to draw these individuals back in. We don't want to shove them away through being harsh or uncaring. Or at least being perceived that way. There's got to be some tact. And finally, one of, the, uh, one of the most important things when it comes to effective communication is many times before we speak, we need to listen. One of the most significant ways that we can connect with others is to close our mouths and open our ears. People are more interested in hearing what you have to say if you listen to them first, or as the old saying goes, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. We see this in Nehemiah. Again, a, a really just a, a, an incredible example of effective leadership in Nehemiah 4. Beginning in verse 9, we see Nehemiah taking, there were some problems that had come up. And we see him taking the time to listen to his people. In Nehemiah 4, uh, beginning in verse 9, says, We prayed to God, and because of them, we set up a guard against them day and night. Thus in Judah it was said, The strength of the burden bearers is failing. Yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Our enemies have said they will not know or see uh, until we come among them, kill them, put a stop to the work. And the Jews who lived near them came, uh, came and told us ten times they'll come up against us from every place uh, where you may turn. And I stationed men in the lowest parts of the, same, uh, of the space behind the wall and exposed the places. And I stationed the people in families with their swords, spears, and bows. And when I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Whenever the people were discouraged, when the people were afraid because, well, this work isn't going anywhere and our enemies are going to come do something about it. Nehemiah, listen, he came up with a solution and he reminded them why they're doing it. First thing he had to do was listen to the concerns. In church leadership, and like I said, we're primarily talking about elders here, but this applies to, to ministers in any position of leading people within the church. We've got to open our ears up and listen to the people. What concerns do they have? What struggles do they have? What temptations do they have? What successes, successes have they had? We've got to listen. We need to teach classes, teach our, teach our uh, future leaders uh, the importance of uh, the importance of uh, listening and communicating properly within the church. And so why is this important? Because if we are to have a strong leadership for the next generation, we've got to do something about our leadership back and we've got to have a plan in place to, uh, to train and bring up, bring up new leaders. And we've talked about some principles that we need to be teaching them. But we've got just a few minutes uh, now I'll share with you a little bit about what we're doing in, in Puyallup to do just that. Uh, a few months back, I sat down with, uh, with my eldership and specifically one of my elders, and we looked at what do we need to teach these men that we have identified as in a few years uh, potentially being our next elders. And we've come up with a list of several classes that we're doing, and in Puyallup what we're doing is, uh, what we're doing is teaching on Sunday afternoons we have these men coming in uh, an hour and a half before our evening service. 
and we're teaching them. We'll do about six to eight weeks of the class, and then we'll take a break for a few weeks, and then we'll come back and cover another subject. But the first thing that we covered with them, we did a class on spiritual formation or spiritual disciplines. This is foundational to church leadership. You can't lead someone to have a relationship with God if you don't already have one yourself. You can't lead someone where you've never been. And we, uh, one of the things that we're doing in each of these classes, because a leader is one who will make commitments and who will make sacrifices. We are having these men read a book in each one of these and come in ready to discuss. In that class, we're, uh, we read the book, The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. And so we've asked them to come in and, and discuss with us, and we're uh, trying to set up more of a discussion class rather than just a lecture to, at the, so that we can grow together and look at how can we draw closer to God. The second one that we did dealt with generic leadership principles, and really the second class and the third class went together because the second one we dealt with some leadership principles, and we read a book that, that discussed some things more from a secular perspective it looked at things like uh, uh, vision. It looked at things like integrity and subjects of that nature and why that's so important in leadership. And now we are in the middle of our third class where we're looking at a series of biblical leaders and looking at, say, for instance, you look at Nehemiah. He had vision. He understood the purpose. He was a man who communicated effectively. And so we, uh, he was a man of integrity. And so all of these things that we can read about in these secular books that are being observed in our world, not just in the church, but are being observed out there as being <coughs> necessary for effective leadership. Here it is in Scripture. If we're going to lead God's people, we've got to have these things. And so we're looking at a series of, uh, of biblical leaders. Um, and in that particular class, we, we are in the middle of reading a book called Hand Me Another Brick by Charles Swindoll. It's a study of the book of Nehemiah and looking at his, uh, the way that he communicated, looking at the way that he had a, a, an understanding of his purpose. And one of the most significant things I think in there is looking at how Nehemiah was a man of prayer. And that short book, you know, like I said, if you want a textbook in the Bible on what good leadership is, go look at Nehemiah. And that short book, we have no less than a dozen times that he prayed that's recorded. If you want to be a spiritual leader, you've got to be a man of prayer. Mm -hmm. Where we're going in the future, and this is where we haven't made it yet, because like I said, we're still in the first time through this, we're going to have a class on mentoring. And we're going to look at how do you reproduce yourself in the role that you're in. And we're going to look at examples such as Moses and his relationship with Joshua. We're going to look at Paul with Timothy and Titus and Jesus with his apostles. And how do we train the next generation to teach them how do you then do what uh, or how do you reproduce yourself in the work you're already doing and have them looking out to people that they can bring along as well? Because leadership succession needs to be a perpetual thing. <clears throat> We're also going to have a class on conflict resolution and difficult doctrinal issues. Because <laughs> as I mentioned, elders have to deal with sometimes angry people who are in conflict either with one another or sometimes people that are in conflict with church leadership. And that's when, you know, the heat gets turned up. It's not, you know, sometimes tempers can flare and that's hard if you've never been exposed to how do you calm down a situation? How do you, how do you de-escalate something if you've never been exposed to that? It's gonna be very difficult to learn it on the spot when you've got somebody really angry that's demanding a solution right now. We're also within that going to look at some of the more divisive and difficult uh, subjects within the brotherhood. How are you going to handle it whenever somebody comes in and they make a really good sounding argument that, you know what, we need to roll a piano in here next week. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to handle it? We're going to discuss that. What does scripture say? What's the purpose of our singing? We're going to look at issues such as marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We're going to look at issues like women's roles, things that we've seen cause lots of division within the brotherhood. Leaders, future elders, need to be prepared for these sorts of things. Because if Satan can divide the church, he will divide the church. And we need to be prepared for what are these divisive issues that are going to come up. And we're going to look at some of these difficult subjects that come up, things that have caused problems in our brotherhood. 
how are you going to be prepared to handle it? Because the time to prepare is not when the problem arises. Amen. Talked about the need for communication. One of our current elders who is uh, who teaches professionally is going to teach these men a class on, uh, and I'm particularly excited about this one because I get to be a participant uh, and get to listen in on one of the best from one of the best Bible class teachers I've ever sat under on how to teach an effective Bible class. Mm -hmm. We've got an elder in, in Puyallup that is one of the best Bible class teachers I've ever heard. And I'm really excited to be able to sit in that class and try to learn from him how can I improve. But I'm excited to get to hear uh, what he had to share on that. And finally, again, communicating God's word, being able to study it and being able to articulate it. We are going to, uh, we'll, we'll finish it out with a course on homiletics. Because if men are to lead the church, they need to be able to communicate the word of God, and we're going to have every one of them stand up and preach a sermon. Not just in theory, you've prepared something that looks good. Stand up and do it. And we're going to, to schedule that for them. We've still got some other things that we need to set in place on, on our program, but these are what we're working on, what we've got so far. And in the homiletics course, what we'll be doing is using the Stafford North book, uh, Preaching, Man and Method. Uh, it's laid out really well, very easy to understand, and it makes the you know preparing a basic sermon uh, not seem like just a uh, just daunting task. He, he breaks it down to where it's uh, into into doable steps for someone who's um, who's not experienced with it. What sort of time frame for all of this? Uh, well, each one of these classes, we've got, I outlined very quickly, there are seven different classes that we're doing in Puyallup. We're doing six to eight weeks apiece with a few weeks of a break between them. So we're looking at a year, year and a half to go through it. Okay. And, uh, and I know that sounds like, well, that's a huge commitment. So is being an elder in the Lord's church. Yeah. Yeah. And if men are not willing to commit the time to show up or the time to read, the time to prepare, they may not be the best one to be put into that position. It's going to make your selection process a lot easier. That's exactly, that's part of the point, so is that it helps to problem. weed out those who will not make the commitment. And so we're looking for men who will do the work and who will not just, you know, kind of show up and be a warm body in the chair, mm -hmm. but who will work, who will be involved or, or engaged in the discussions. Men who are actually looking to learn and to grow. And so as we watch this, we're, or as we do this, we're, we're paying attention to who's in there. And okay, we've got, you know, we've got a guy over here we're a little bit concerned with this individual, you know, maybe down the road, but here's what he needs to learn. Hey, we've got a really good prospect here. And we're, we're kind of, between the elders and the ministers, we're observing because one of the blessings that we have is that the entire el current eldership and the entire ministry staff show up at every one of these classes. And so we not only have me up here who's inexperienced and sometimes doesn't know what I'm doing, trying to teach these things, I can teach them, here's what the book says, but then we'll have one of the elders and say, that will raise his hand and say, here's what this looks like. And that's invaluable. Now we've got, I think, just a couple of more minutes, uh, or just a, just a few more minutes in here. Uh, we'll open it up if anybody's got any uh, comments or questions or anything like that. I saw a hand back here. Yeah, I got a question. So, at, where you're implementing this, every elder has committed to, to showing up for all these classes, you said? Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, my current elders? Yeah, this plan where you're implementing it now, you said all of your current elders are committed to showing up for all these classes? If they have been, aside from when one of them's been sick or out of town, they have been at every one of them and they are active in the discussions. Okay. Uh, and that, that makes this go so much more smoothly, like I said, because well, I can say, here's what the Bible says about it, or here's what secular uh, books are, are saying about this principle. They can say, here's what um, here's what this looks like in the eldership. The, the reason why I ask is, hypothetically, how what, how would you go about it if you were to present, hey, current elders, there's all these classes I'd like for you to take, and then you get one or several of them saying, I don't have time to commit to that. It, or do you have a short, reasonable answer that I can wait? <laughs> well, the only short answer I have to that is I don't know. I haven't faced that. Okay. Uh, this is the first time I've ever tried to implement this, and uh, 
thankfully, uh, I have elders that they have all said, yes, we'll be there absolutely every time that we can. Uh, and, and I mean, there's times whenever, you know, one's not able to make it or, or things like that, but they're committed to being a part of it, uh, which that which is essential because, you know, looking at reproducing uh, the eldership within the church, you really need the involvement of the current eldership if you have that's, because to me, that's the key, Tom. If you don't have elder buy-in, you can't start something like this. you got to have current elder buy-in to make this work or anything yes. like this work. Yes, and that's been the real blessing in Puyallup is we've got 100% buy-in on the elders and the ministers, uh, and it has made this go incredibly smoothly so far. Ron? On how you uh, go about selecting men to attend these classes, are they like... Mm -hmm. Uh, close to the age, or maybe even they're young in their twenties, and this would be a great value to them for twenty years later. But I'm just curious who you choose and how you go about that. Uh, well, who we're choosing, where it, it's not tied specifically to an age. We've got a couple that have been in there that have been in their twenties, but mainly we're looking at you know mid thirties and and up uh, of men who have some experience. But we're looking at character. We're looking at their families. Are these men who are teaching their kids? They're faithful families. Uh, we're looking at the maturity level of their involvement with the church. Are these men who are um, involved in teaching? We look really hard at our deacons because they're already doing some uh, really good works. Um, but it's a hand-selected uh, group that comes from the suggestions within the eldership and the ministry staff. We're looking out saying, here is someone that I see who has potential. And then we're contacting them individually and bringing them into the group. Yeah, um, if, if you're for us, we're, we're quite a young congregation. A new congregation has grown vast, so there's a lot of people. Um, so obviously, a lot of the work I tend to be doing myself, you know, as a, a kind of an eldership role where I'm not an elder. Um, if you was to develop something like this, would, would it be advisable to utilise elders from other congregations to see if they would come on board with you, or would that be something? It would not work. I think if you've got a, a congregation, a more mature congregation yeah. in the area that has yeah. elders, that has good elders that are, you know, you have got a congregation there, and you can see by that church that they're going the direction they need to, and those elders are willing to help you out, you could use I would them. I would absolutely use them because that's a that's a resource for you. I mean, because what, what, one of the issues we have as well, it's a cultural issue because we have a lot of people who come over to the UK from... Uh, Africa, like Nigeria, Uganda, they've gone by Italy. Many of them were converted in Europe and came over to the UK. So, so they bring a lot of, uh, of that, you might say, traditions as well, which you've got to try and gently break through, you know, in order to get to this culture. And uh, yeah, so it can be quite a challenge. Yeah, well, and that would add another dynamic to it. I've not faced that in the context of this program. Uh, yeah. That would I'm not sure how you would wade through that exactly, other than you know getting them to help you with you know some of the basic principles. But the culture mm. that's going to add a whole other layer to yeah. <laughs> excuse me to the complication of this. I'm, uh, you're using Nehemiah as an example of leadership there, and I've heard Nehemiah used in a lot of you know this is how to be a good Christian leader. How do you deal with the end of the book of Nehemiah? You know, he goes away and he comes back and everything's gone to pot. There's a guy living in the temple. Uh, people are violating the Sabbath. And Nehemiah starts slapping people and pulling hair out and stuff like that. I mean, I, you know, I'm not... I, I'm curious how you handled the end of, of that book. If it's just, you know, leaders are perfect or if it's just you can be a great leader... And you're still going to, if the people's hearts aren't there, they're not going to turn back to God. You know, so I, I don't know. I'm just curious how you feel that. Yeah, yeah, don't advise them to slap people in the air. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise those actions specifically within the church. I, I think you, you mentioned a couple of things there. Number one, you mentioned something really important there. There is no such thing as the perfect leader, save for Jesus Christ. But one of the things you see in Nehemiah there, and I'm speaking about a principle here, is his, uh, his intolerance for sin. He saw things that were wrong, and this absolutely can't stand. You know, I mean, you see that with, well, when Israel got defeated at Ai, they're yeah. sent in the camp. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Joshua falls on his face, and 
you know, he's praying before the Lord where he's been defeated. And why is this happening? And God says, what are you doing on your face? Get up. There's sin in the camp. Go deal with it. And he gives him instructions on how to do it. But you see Nehemiah dealing with the sin. Now, like I said there, it's not a, an exact parallel because, you know, I mean, Right. You can't really start. You can't really start suggesting that you go pull people's hair out. You're in sin. You know. yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a teacher who told me that you can give people the right foot to fellowship sometimes. There you go. I guess that's what was going on here. Uh, any other questions, comments? Um, did you present it to the entire congregation that that this is what we're going to be doing? keep the lookout or I mean did you present it that way or just invitation only um, if we've done this invitation only uh, specifically hand selected by current leaders uh, because there are in some contexts this wouldn't necessarily be the case everywhere there are a lot of variables here that you know logistically how would you do this in another church the way we're going about doing the training in Puyallup mm -hmm. may not be the best in uh, was surprise Arizona. Le Lester, there's gonna or yeah, or Leicester, England. There's there's gonna be some variables to the congregations in Puyallup. We're doing it. Uh, who is being selected? Um, because as I mentioned, not everyone is cut out for church leadership. Not everyone is cut out. This is a an eternally significant job, and not everyone has the maturity. And you have some. If you open it up to everyone, you have some who think they have the maturity who will derail the class. Mm -hmm. and, I, was, I was coming back to the comment he made, okay, which is true. If you've been working in Christ, we know with the congregation we have 21 nationalities. Okay? And then most churches in Europe not made up of local people, but foreign people. You know, so I can best play people from either. So therefore, you have to have a lot of wisdom, a lot of patience, and take, talk to them, get, you know, listen to them, you know. To hear what they feedback, what they say about the church in the country. Because what happened is many times they want to impose the word doing things as they do back in their country. That's right. That's so, right. And yes. that's, you know, so it's a difficult uh, task to handle. So you have to pray, a lot of patience, and be listening. Amen. Well, the only that's document it. that is transcultural is the Bible. So that's where we're going to stay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, some good information on dealing with multiple cultures. Like I said, within our context, we've not had to deal with that particular thing, but I know uh, Roland here has and his work in Paris, and so uh, I'm sure he probably has a, a great deal more insight on how to deal with that problem. I'll get his email. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, you got my email? <laughs> well, I think we're just about out of time, so I, uh, thank you. We'll, we'll close up there. I appreciate everyone's uh, comments and attention. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Was great. If you want any more information on what we're doing in Puyallup, I'll be glad to share it with you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.